Hello and welcome to another edition of Racing Post Memory Lane, where today I'll be talking to dual Grand National winning jockey, Leighton Aspel. Must be quite a nice feeling to be described as a dual Grand National winning jockey, isn't it, Leighton? Yeah, very much so. Ever since then, <coughs> at the races, are, are in, in, in lots of different ways. It, it's how you introduce now. And it's, <laughs> yeah, it is. It, 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 it's, it, it, it's something else. So, go back to the beginning then, the early days. How did you, or first and foremost, where did you grow up and, and what was the sort of family background like? Um, I grew up in, in County Kildare in Ireland and um, my, dad had, um, my dad had a permit but he also worked very hard full time. Um, he worked for the, um, the, the old Coral Blue Stock Agency, he was a flying groom. Okay. So he was often away from home quite a lot which left me uh, looking after the, the couple of horses we had in. So yeah. you know, I had to muck out and feed, and then eventually I was, I, was, I was allowed to ride them out when I progressed from ponies and stuff like that. So I was often, uh, quite often, holding the reins at home. So I think it helped me. It helped me grow up quickly, you know, at, at a young age. You were the man of the house at a young age. Well, you? I was the eldest son, but anyway, uh, yeah, it, um, you know, I was, uh, I was, I was chucked in the deep end a few times. Right, but by the sound of things, horses were sort of an integral part of family life, were they? Yeah, my dad. Road as an amateur, uh, he worked over here in this country and back in Ireland, n numerous jobs and he worked uh, uh, as, as I said, a flying groom for this, the old CBA and then um, and he, he worked at Giltown Stud and uh, it was very successful with Bird Fire and Storm and mm. then it was sold to Japanese, Japanese people, um, very successful stud um, and, and now he, he works with uh, Sean Mulrine, um, he, he racing manager for Sean Mulrine of, of Ballymore Properties. Right. Mm. So where did, uh, you, what, what, sort of what point did you decide that being a jockey was what you wanted to do? Oh yeah, you know, it was maybe 13 or 14. Okay. Yeah, um, I progressed from, from ponies then. And um, I was riding yearlings, all sort of autumn and winter um, in, in Kilcarn Stud, which is, uh, it's great fun, but it's, it's great experience. It, it doesn't have to uh, uh, improve your riding. You, you, <laughs> you, you, you've got to be sharp because, you know, little, little flapper yearlings, yeah. what, what they were like. But, um, and then they had a license for a little while um, through the stud. And um, you could ride in Ireland when you're 15. Right. Um, so while I was still at school, I got my apprentice license out. I had 10 rides, I think, while, while I was still at school. My dad and a couple of other trainers. And that really, you know, that's really when the, the bug bit. Um, I was then, you could ride in this country when, when you're 16, anyway, I was sort of just beginning to put a bit of weight on and we decided, well, there's more opportunities in the UK and it could just be the right time to go. I was January 93, I, I was still, mm. um, yeah, I was 16, yeah, I was, yeah, I was, I was 16 then, January 93, and uh, anyway, I managed to persuade my mum to let me leave school and uh, I went and joined uh, Reg Holland Tech. Um, in Staffordshire, yeah. who had a you know a, a very famous reputation of, of creating you know good apprentices, and uh, it was it was a super place to work, surrounded by a lot older and more experienced uh, jockeys, experienced jockeys, and it, it really it really helped me. It's quite a big step at sixteen to move to all right, you know, geographically not a million miles, but still to another country. Were you sort of supported by anyone over here, or like or, you know, what was that like? Look, I, I, was, I was a bit homesick, but you know it was a great job. You know, I was in, the, in, in some digs with three or four other apprentices, and uh, you know everybody was just driven by racing, and uh, it, was, it was it was a great place to work. Very disciplined, uh, but uh, great experience. Loved it, absolutely yeah. loved it. Okay. And how did your career progress from there? Well, I got a job with Josh Kiffers in, in the August, just as the horses were coming in, and. It was at the time, just in the May before Declan Murphy had a really bad accident in, 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 in the Swinton Hurdle. Okay. And Philip Hyde then was sort of promoted to be stable jockey at Josh Giffords. There was quite a few jockeys around then. Uh, at, at Josh's, uh, Simon McNeil was riding for Palmer Partners. Uh, Peter Hobbs was riding as well. M. Murphy, um, lots, of, lots of good jockeys. And uh, you know, there, there was a, a quite, a, quite a, a queue but I think and some good conditions too. I think the, the fact that I had that hundred odd rides on the flat, I think it, it, it really helped me a lot. Okay. And uh, you know, then thankfully, I got my first ride over jumps in the January of 
would have been 1995 at Warwick. And then I had my first winner for Richard Rowe in the, in the May time at Huntingdon. And then that was the time in the old season as well, but it broke up then. And then I went back to Ireland for four, six weeks and then came back in. And then actually, you know, it, it, it really kicked off in the next season. Okay. Mm. And obviously, fast forward then to 2001, and your first sort of big winner, I suppose, was the Welsh National on Supreme Glory. Mm. That must have been a pretty sort of significant turning point in the career. Yeah, it was. Prior to that, I'd actually, I'd, as, a as, a, in a, as a condition, I'd won the Swinton for, for, for Peter Bowen. So then, yeah, I had to wait another four years. Then we won the national, Welsh National for Supreme Glory. So it was a really late starting, late maturing, but very progressive horse then. You know, he didn't, I think his first race, maybe he was about seven. And um, straight over fences, but, uh, uh, you know, he, he, he was well campaigned and well trained by Pat Murphy. And he was placed in the Scottish National. He was placed in, in the Grand National. He won the Devon National. He was, he was, he was a really good solid stayer, he was. And you, I think it's fair to say, you'd have a pretty good record or a good, you'd be a good rider of those sort of staying chases. Is that something you feel yourself? Um... Yes, and I think it, 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 that has probably uh, progressed as, as I've got older, as I've got older, more, more experience, you know, just trying to be more, more relaxed in, in the race and, you know, ride, you know, be very respectful of the trip and conditions and, uh, you, know, you know, get your horse jumping well and, you know, conserving energy where possible. Going back to Supreme Glory, um, you mentioned that he was placed in the National, he was second, of course, your first ride in the Grand National. Yeah. What's that feeling like? Because presumably on the one hand, you're delighted to have been second in your first national, but on the other hand, you've come agonisingly close to winning Jump Racing's biggest prize. Well, it was such a buzz, first of all, to riding, but then you know, to get round. Uh, but like, he'd come, he was, the race was run on good, maybe good to firm ground, and it was a fast run race, and he was, he was outpaced for most of the race, um, Supreme Glory. Like I jumped the last in fifth, like, but he really, you know, he really finished his race well to finish second. You know, I never really got a sniff of victory. Monty's pass was a, was a 12, le ease down 12 length winner. Um, you know, I was jumped the last thing and I, I'm going to be fifth, I'm going to be fourth, I'm going to be in the winners of course, you know, I'm going to be third and going to Wellborn tied up and uh, we passed Amberley House too in the running. It was a, it was, it was a hell of a, a, hell of a buzz. Yeah. Hmm. And you were probably, I think, fair to say, pretty established then by that stage. Um, so established, in fact, that you had you developed your own fan club. Mm -hmm. the, the, the only jockey, to my knowledge, the British jockey anyway, to have his own fan club. How did that come about? <laughs> well, it, it certainly wasn't my invention. I can tell you, <laughs> this goes back a long way. This goes back to the old racing channel. Okay. And they had like a, a, a tipsters uh, table and stuff like that and between the presenters. And then, you know, the general public and the winners of the general public one, uh, you know, were given the opportunity to to join in with the presenters in, 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 their, in their table. Mm. And they just had to give themselves a name. It could have been, you know, Superman or whatever. <laughs> but anyway, this guy, this guy uh, is locally based in Worthing. Anyway, he, he, he was he put in, put in quite, he was, he was a father of mine and he was putting in quite a few of my horses and those horses odds enabled him to win the tipster, the general public one. Okay. So he just called it the Late National Fan Club. And it, right. just, it, just, it just caught on because it was on the racing channel every few days, on, you know, they were showing the table and stuff like that. And it, just, mm. it, just, it just grew and um, you know, people contacted him and just snowballed it, it, into something. It, it was good fun, I got lots of stick about it all the time. But uh, <laughs> you know, he had a magazine and mugs and stuff like that. But anyway, it, was, it was harmless stuff. And John texts me all the time about my, about my horses to pick for the season and stuff like that and you know checking how I am if I was injured or, or whatever but you know get him tickets for the races he, he, you know he's, he's, a, he's a really big racing fan. Okay. Mm. Do you have any of the merchandise yourself? Uh, I there's got to be something here, here somewhere yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm guessing you wouldn't wear I'm it I'm not out. getting them out no, no <laughs> not, it's not merchandise no but some mugs and stuff okay. like that. <laughs> because things were going well you were riding plenty of winners and things like that but you chose to take what turned out to be a sabbatical did you sort of what was the decision behind quitting and then obviously returning? I'm mean, presuming you, you sort of missed race riding quite a lot after that first decision to retire. Yeah, I, I didn't at first. Um, well, things were just a, a, just a little bit quiet coming towards the end of the season. Just wasn't really getting an, 
as much as a buzz out of it that I felt I should be getting. Mm. And I thought maybe, I was in my early 30s, I thought maybe it's time I should be looking elsewhere. Mm. I didn't know what I wanted to do. But anyway, I made the decision and I got a job locally working with John Dunlop as a pupil assistant. Good job, mm. easy job. And I was working for a good guy um, uh, just for something to do. But yeah, within a, a, a reasonably short space time, I thought, I'm not sure if I made the right decision, but then it was just a case of having the courage to make the, the decision to, to to try again, or to you know to, to approach people who you know to see if it was going to be worthwhile. Mm. Uh, yeah, that's hard because obviously, you know, in that time, presumably trainers would have other jockeys and things mm. that they'd be using. So it's it's a it's quite a big step, isn't it, to come back into it and hope that you're supported. Yeah. Yeah, and you know, if there was only average reaction from people, maybe I mightn't have, but anyway, people, they're all pretty positive, people have ridden mm. before, before, even as you say, they'd got on and got new jockeys and stuff like that, um, uh, so I reapplied and, 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 and off we went, we started schooling them and, and then the, the rise started to come in. And then in that sort of second half of your career, you, it wasn't that long, 2014, I think if I'm getting my dates right, when you enjoyed one of the biggest days of your career, of course, winning the Grand National on Pinot de Rey. It's a... A question I'm sure you're asked all the time, but what did that feel like to cross the line in front in the Grand National? Yeah, wonderful feeling because I had some other riders in the Nationals between 2001 and then, you know, got round, pulled up, fell, you know, you know. Uh, so, I, you know, I, I tasted the other side of it mm. a lot. Um, and you, you grow up seeing the Nationals, all the reruns, all the post race interviews and stuff like that. You, you you crave something like that, mm. uh, and so when it eventually happened, it, 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 it was a great feeling. Um, Doctor Newland was having a really good season. I was picking up some nice rides for Doctor Newland, and Peanut Array had run really well in a hurdle race at Cheltenham. That's right. Fast finishing third uh, was Sam Twiston Davis. Yeah, then he he went uh, and jumped on one of Nicholas's. That's right. Um, so the, the you know the ride on Peanut Array became available. And I remember I was reading in the Racing Post going racing one day and some like, Newland, Dr. Newland on the lookout for a rider. Anyway, I, I, I just texted the man because I'd been riding a few for him and well, two hours later he texted back and we were, we were in business. Yeah. And, and then, you know, the rest is history. Yeah, fortunate text that. Very, yeah. 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 <laughs> and of course, it wasn't long you had to wait to experience that feeling again because the, the following year you did what very few jockeys have done and you won a second Grand National in a row on many clouds who... I think it's fair to say it's been a pretty special horse for you. Yeah, it has. Well, I had to get off Pinot de Rey to ride Many yeah. Clouds, which not many people would ever do, get off a national winner. Um, and I probably wouldn't for any other horse but, but Many Clouds. One, for the horse he was, and then two, because he, he was trained by you know my biggest supporter in Oliver. Mm. And it was only just after his Gold Cup run, we thought he wasn't going to run, and my focus was, was on Pinot de Rey. Um, but anyway, when the decision was made to run the horse, uh, you know, I didn't, you know, I was, I was, it, it was never going to be anything else but many clouds. Mm. Well, actually, it's quite remarkable because if you look at the horse's form, all twenty-seven of his races, you were his jockey, weren't mm. you? Which is uh, quite unprecedented, really. Yeah, one that, yeah, you're, 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 you're not injured or something, or you're through suspension, or God forbid, or you know, like, you know you're always available to ride the horse, and mm. you know, thankfully. That, that's the way it worked out. I think it was probably the only person to school him to from right, right from the beginning. And uh, no, we, we, we had a special relationship. He was a clever horse, wasn't he? Very clever. But also he had that massive will to win. And, you know, he, he, would, he would run through the pain barrier time and time again. You know, it's a, it's a very, very rare quality. Mm. And again, a question you've probably been asked numerous times and a bit of a difficult question. But how do the two national victories compare like is it is it just is it a similar feeling is it the second time is it like good lord i can't believe this happened again is it more special because it's the second time or because of the association with many clouds how do how do the two compare mm. you know all of that you know one that you can't believe this is happening a second time uh for on, on a different horse as well but you know it's such a such a such a special horse for me but you, know, you can't believe it. Even when I jumped the last, and I think this, this can't happen a second time. Mm. Like I knew I had the horse there, but you know something's got to happen. Something's got to come late and fast and catch me because, you know, these these things just don't happen. Yeah. It, you know, it hasn't happened, or, or, you know, in, in somebody's career. But you know, thankfully, it, it did for me. 
And actually, I was fortunate enough to, to join you at the, the Paul Rugby Club for the sort of the, the party, the celebratory party. And I remember the atmosphere was just incredible when we watched the rerun. Because mm. you had the jockey cam, That's didn't right, you? Yeah. On mm. the helmet. Mm. It was just, uh, that must be a mad feeling, just watching it back, reliving yeah. it. Yeah. Like, I, I, people mention that everywhere I go, <laughs> all over the world. I've really? ridden in Italy since. People have mentioned, you know, where they watch it on YouTube, or whatever. Yeah. Czechoslovakia, Bratislava, <laughs> America. People said, "Hey, I watched that. I watched your, um, I watched your headcam, Manny yeah. Clares, and you know, that's probably <laughs> the, 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 the most English to have." But they could say, you know, Manny Clares, Manny Clouds. Yeah, yeah, no, really special. It was, a, it was a hugely popular horse, um, and of course, tragedy struck for him, rather well, sadly, at Cheltenham, when he ran. Arguably one of his best races ever, beating yeah. Thistlecrack, who at the time was almost invincible, wasn't he? Um, as you've just said, he would always run through the pain barrier, and it wouldn't be the first time he would collapse after winning um, or, or running a race. That must have been just horrible to kind of witness that and be involved in that and to see this horse that so many people loved go down and, and not get back up. Yeah. Like, he, he actually never had collapsed before. I didn't know. He got the wobbles a few okay. times. So then when he did go down that day, I thought, he's okay. not going to get up now. Because during my career, I've, a few times after the rest, a few horses have you know, suffered a heart attack and gone down. And it, it, it's a very weird feeling, but once, once you've experienced it once, you know, you know the symptoms and you know he got the wobbles. And I was speaking to Ollie Bell and we're just waiting for, you know, to, to come through for, a, for an interview. Um, and then he stopped and just took some backward steps and, and, and he was gone down and, and, and that was that. And it was, you know, there was a, it, some horses really just resonate with the public, and he did particularly, and there was a real sort of outpouring, outpouring of emotion after mm. that, wasn't there, yeah. Yeah, yeah, the, 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 yeah, the public really took to him, yeah. you know, from his Hennessy to his, uh, uh, you know, to his national member. You know, they loved the first courage, and, you know, mm. he, he'd show them all, you know, a huge amount of courage out there at Cheltenham. That's it. And, and after that, you continue to have plenty of winners, plenty of good seasons, but the time came more recently that you said... I'm going to retire. What what were the sort of influencing factors in that decision this time? Um, probably, probably my age. As you say, I'm, I'm getting, I was thinking lots of rides. I was very well supported. Um, and I, all through my career, I always thought when I seen senior jockeys retire, I just I was always just wondering what they were thinking about at, at, at the time, and thought, well, I wonder how it would feel for me. Mm. Um, you know, there's. Actually, this season, there's younger jockeys than me next to me, right by, uh, by my side was Wayne Hutchinson, um, Andrew Tinkler, you know, younger guys than me have, 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 have retired. Uh, a couple of years ago, Paul Maloney retired, and an injury was in that as well, but, you know, um, you know, lots of very good riders, and then some older riders, like Andrew Thornton as well, he was on, he was on our bench, mm. um, so I was getting a bit lonely over there, <laughs> but uh, uh, I don't know. Just probably from a few months back, anyway, it was, it was in the back of my mind, and I thought maybe the end of the season could be my last national, my last Cheltenham. Uh, but it's just it, it began to weigh heavier and heavier, and I was still loving, it. I was loving it more than ever. But still, it, it was in the back of my mind, and you know, when I'd made the decision, then that it was going to be on the on the Sunday of Fontwell, you know, that was it. And actually, it was a weight off my mind because it was my, yeah. my mind before that was when when's a good time, when do I tell people? Anyway, I made a decision. Actually, I, it was it was it was quite a relief just to make that decision and just yeah. tell everybody it was going to happen that day. Yeah, it's interesting you mentioned there on your bench. Does, is there a sort of uh, a special bench reserved for the sort of uh, I'll, I'll be sensitive with this the sort of senior riders in the yeah, way? As, yeah, as you know, as they've been one with age, but be with, with that firm. You know, as one retires, you just just move up a slot all the time. Okay. And I, I've been number one well since Andrew retired, Andrew Thornton. Um, and then Wayne was next to me and Andrew Tinkler too, and them two jumped off the bench a while ago. So there was, there was, there was a few gaps there. Barry Garrity, when he comes over, next to us, and Robbie Power. Right. Um, so yeah, it'll be. Yeah, it'll, um, that, that's generally the way it works. Richard Johnson's on number one on the other side. Okay. And then okay, before it was Noel, but now it's Richard. And yeah. yeah, that's just the way it works. So now that you have retired, what, what are you up to? I've had a, nearly, nearly a whole month off now. It's been great. Well, well you know, it's, not, it's not a month off, but from actually no work. We do some pre-training at Amanda Paris, but um, 
that's just small scale stuff. But you know, being with the kids, doing the school runs, uh, and and just being around really, not really chasing my tail. Um, mm. You know, I don't have to get up now and think about I've got to be somewhere at a certain time, so I must quickly do this before I leave at nine to get to Warwick or to do something. And you know, then you know the, the structure of my whole day has changed. The structure of my whole life has changed, but I don't have to think so far. Your whole week was. Uh, function, you know, I was in Lambourne every Thursday, I'd be in Newmarket another day and you'd squeeze in other trainers, uh, you know, when, when meetings allowed, if it was local meetings, you'd try to fit in local trainers, Nick Gifford and, and, and some other trainers, or some, some Epsom trainers. Um, but it's very structured. And the, that slight bit of I miss, you miss the, you know, you have to be, you know, very disciplined, you know, cause, mm. you know and be very conscious of time and to get somewhere without any traffic delays and, you know, stuff like that. Um, you know, I, w I won't miss the travelling on the roads. I miss seeing, you know, you, you, you develop a very, very, very great knowledge of, of the country. <laughs> the countryside through roads. Mm. When, when one road is busy, you, you divert it off, you, you get around all the villages and towns and you get to know the country really, really well. Um, you know, there'll be probably parts of the country I'll never see again because yeah. racing has always brought me, you know, th them sort of areas. But um, look, I've, I've had a, I've had a, great career and I'm, I'm a very lucky boy. The one final question last year is, are you still running? Because you have, again, first-hand experience of <laughs> you being a bloody good runner. <laughs> uh, I used to do a lot as well. Um, one for fitness and B for sort of weight control. Um, I've not done a whole lot the last month, but I will get back into it because I love it. Mm. Uh, some some long distance running. When the, kids are get, when the kids are getting bigger now, there's always something to do on the weekends, be with the ponies or something. That takes up a lot of time. Uh, we did a park run with the kids, okay. uh, but yeah, I, I, I certainly won't give up on my running, no. Excellent. Leighton, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. Thank you very much for your time. No, thank you.